So as Bill said, this is a fantastic chapter and there's a lot to it. So we are at Luke chapter 19 tonight. <clears throat> then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now, behold, there was a rich man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and he was rich. So when they say that he was a chief tax collector, like he was a tax collector above tax collectors. And we all know that tax collectors were not typically good people. They ripped their own people off. So they weren't very popular. So if you were a chief tax collector, that's like being like a chief politician that, um, that is very crooked. So <laughs> that's who we're talking about right now. And you could, you'd know that he would be very hated among all the Hebrews in this society here. Verse three. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but he could not because of the crowd, for he was of short stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. And so you can picture this guy. He's a short guy. He's very hated amongst all the Hebrews, but he has a lot of money. So he's climbing up into this tree. And one of the commentators said that sycamore tree probably had a lot of leaves. So he's probably trying to hide. Just He just wants, he's very curious. He wants to see Jesus. Who is this Jesus that everybody's talking about, right? So he's up there hiding in the tree, just wanting to get a glimpse of Jesus. And um, I think a lot of people are like that. They want to get a glimpse of Jesus. And sometimes for them, we are the only glimpse of Jesus that they're ever going to get. So they, they, they know that we go to church. They know that we do certain things. So it's like, we could be their only glimpse. So it's like, we want to make sure it's a very favorable glimpse that encourages them to, you know, get out of that tree and come join us, right? <clears throat> so, um, so he ran, so he's in the tree and verse five, and when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and he saw him. And we know that Jesus sees everything. So even if you're trying to hide from him, even if you just want to take a peek and, and really not be involved with him, you're making that effort. He's going to see you and he wants us to engage with him. He doesn't want us to have a distant relationship. He wants us, no matter how sinful, no matter how hated we might think we are, he loves us and he wants us to be with him. He looked up and he saw him and he said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down for today I must stay at your house. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, they all complained saying, he has gone to be a guest with this man who is a sinner. So here you see, of course, all the Pharisees are judging him. They're around him. They're watching everything that he does. And they see that he, that he not only takes up with this guy for dinner, but he invites himself like he initiated this. So he initiates this to be with Zacchaeus, who is a very hated a thief, a, a sinner, a, somebody that has ripped off the entire community and they're like complaining against him. Like, hey, look, he's gone to be his guest of this guy. Verse eight, then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, look, Lord, I give half of all my goods to the poor. And if I've taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. So here this man has been in the presence of Jesus and so touched by him that he is saved and he is wanting to make right. He is repenting and he is making amends for what he has done. He, he's just like, I'm giving half of everything I own to the poor. And remember, this guy would have been a billionaire. He would have had billions and he gave half and he was making up for anybody that he did falsely to. Verse nine, and Jesus said to him, Today, salvation has come to this house because he also is a son of Abraham. For the son of man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. And so you have this beautiful picture of Jesus talking about salvation that we all can have. Each one of us is a sinner. So he bestowed this, you know, this, this guy, he repented, he made good, he, he, you know, fell to his feet for Jesus, and 
and his prize was at salvation, you know, which we can all have, which anyone can have. Jesus wants us all to be saved because the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And we know that Zacchaeus was lost. He was a grand sinner, a thief. A thief. He was you know, the thief of all thieves, like he would take as much as he could from people to make himself wealthy. So he was the chief tax collector. So he was definitely lost. But the son of man came to seek and to save that which was lost. So just knowing that Jesus is, he is here and he is seeking those of us that are lost is a beautiful picture of, of his mercy and of his kindness and of the reason that he came here for us. And the reason why Christianity is such a beautiful and powerful religion. It's full of mercy. You don't have that in a lot of other religions. So that's that's a beautiful little picture there of Zacchaeus. Verse 11. Can I say something before you go on to the next one? Sure. Look, if you look at verse 7, it says, All who saw it began to grumble and said, He has gone to the, be a guest of one of who is a sinner. It's a I think that that parable is as much about the Sadducees and Pharisees and the way they reacted to a guy who was, in fact, a great sinner, but now is repenting. They didn't share. Jesus showed joy in that and uh, was happy that the guy had turned from his wicked ways. And they were grumbling because he wasn't uh, one of the boys down at the synagogue. And so he, they, they, they were against it. And I, I think... Here again, we see, I know I'm forever bringing this up, but we see the, the position that the religious of the day were taking in this, in this situation. And, and, uh, and Jesus came to save anybody who would be willing to repent. And another thing, too, is I, I think that probably a lot of those guys that were grumbling didn't have a right relationship. They weren't receiving Christ, and they, they were just a— they were against Jesus, and right. and uh, so and so. This really goes to to really back up that thing that we always say: God wants a relationship with us, not a religion. Right. And so, all these guys that were grumbling had a religion with with God. Yes. weren't yes. weren't sure yet who Je if Jesus was who he said he was. But Zacchaeus recognized him immediately, repented, turned from his sin, and and uh, and. Like you said, Avery gave half, probably half a billion dollars in today's money out. It just uh, complete surrender. Absolutely. And uh, it's interesting that the religious people of the day weren't having it. Yeah. Right. It, it is. It is. Uh, mm -hmm. they, they didn't want to see people repent. They wanted them to turn to them for everything. Yeah. And not and to do good surrender. works. Yeah. All about good works. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> Verse 11. Now, as they heard these things, he spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. So you'll remember that they thought that if Jesus came here as the Messiah, then he would be this fierce warrior that would take everything back from the Romans and grant the, the Hebrews the power, right? Verse 12. Therefore, he said, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. So he called 10 of his servants, delivered to them 10 min minas and said to them, do business till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. So this is a, a picture of Jesus who came to reign over his peop people who were the Jewish people. And he, they hated him and they would not have him to reign over them. So you're, you're kind of getting this parallel here. Verse 15. And so it was that when he returned, having received the kingdom, he still took his kingdom and he came back. He then commanded these servants to whom he'd given the money. Now, these servants are representative of us. So anything that he's given us in terms of money, 
in terms of talent, in terms of anything that we can do to further the kingdom. That's what we've been given and that's what he's waiting to see from us. To be called to him that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first saying, Master, your minna has earned 10 minas. And he said to him, well done, good servant. Because you were faithful in very little, have authority over 10 cities. And the second came and said, Master, your minna has earned five minutes. Likewise, he said to him, you also will be over five cities. Then came another saying, Master, here is your minna, which I have kept put away in a handkerchief. For I feared you because you are an austere man. So like a cruel leader, right? That's what he's saying. You collect what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. And he said to him, out of your own mouth, I will judge you, you wicked servant. You knew that I was an austere man collecting what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank that at my coming, I might have collected it with interest? And he said to those who stood by, take the minna from him and give it to him who has 10. But they said to him, master, he has 10 minas. For I say to you, that to everyone who has will be given, and from him who does not have, even that which he has will be taken away from him. But bring here those enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them and slay them before me. Okay, very powerful, powerful chapter here. Uh, and in this piece right here, you're seeing that he gives us, he gives us a certain amount of talent, a certain amount of money, a certain amount of, of of spirit fruits of the spirit how we use those it says a lot when when our time comes if we choose not to do anything with them if we choose just to be i'm saved and that's all that matters and i'm just going to go through life you know worrying about myself you can still be saved you can still get to heaven you can still see him but he is not going to be happy with you in your service and we as we store up treasures in heaven as we do things for the poor, as we tithe, as we do the things that, that we are to do as good servants, as good stewards, we are storing up riches in heavens. So as he's giving us talents, if we're using those talents to further his kingdom, we will be rewarded as such. So it, it really speaks to the fact that we shouldn't be here and just be very complacent. We need to be active while we're here. We're here such a short time that the time that we're here needs to be very fruitful. So anything to add to that, Tom? Well, yeah, the, uh, this is clearly Luke's, Luke's version of the five talents told in, is it Matthew? I think Matthew, mm -hmm. Mark or Matthew, I think Matthew. And oh. uh, it's, it's the same, same story from a different viewpoint. Yes. And uh, yeah, exactly. You nailed it, Avery. We got, we got to use what God gives us uh, toward God. And, uh, and, re and reinvest it and uh, cause it to multiply. That's right. And uh, we're not just responsible for getting ourselves to heaven. We're responsible. What Pastor Ray always say, I'm going to heaven and I'm taking as many of you as, with me as I can. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's, that's, that's the deal, huh? Yes. We need to always be at it. We're always trying to bring more people into the kingdom. Amen. And, to uh, and, and, and to do... Uh, we're, not, we're not saved by good works, but we work from a position of salvation and uh, uh, to uh, work induced to, to do good. Like Zacchaeus in the previous uh, parable there, usually when Jesus tells these parables, they're, they're, they're similar. Zacchaeus was moved uh, after his repentance. He was moved. Jesus didn't tell him he had to give away half his money. He just, he did it. And uh, that's how we should, we must be. We receive our gifts, our talents, and so on and so forth. And we're to apply them to increase uh, the number of folks going to have. That's right. And people mistakenly assume that, that I've earned this, I've worked hard for this, this is my money. And it's like, no. Yeah. <laughs> Anything that you have is because God gave it to you. you know? That's so, right. You know, so, yeah, just, just making sure that we all are aware of that, you know. I, I, 
seems like a no-brainer, but sometimes people lose sight of that. Verse 28. And when he had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass when he drew near to Bethphage or and Bethany at the mountain called Olivet, that he sent two of his disciples saying, go into the village opposite you, whereas you enter, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you loosing it? You shall say to them, because the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent away went their way and found it, just as he said to them. But as they were loosing the colt, the owners of it said to them, why are you loosing the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of him. Then they brought him to Jesus and they threw their clothes on the colt and they sat Jesus on him. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. So you have this picture of this donkey colt. He's fulfilling prophecy here. Now, if you've ever ridden a horse or a donkey that um, that isn't broke, you'll know what happens. <laughs> Typically, <laughs> they're very anxious. They're going to buck you off. It's It doesn't usually end well unless you are the horse whisperer. And obviously, like, this donkey knew exactly who was sitting on him. He knew this was his Lord, even as the disciples were still kind of unclear on that. But, the, you know, the animals knew. They knew. And so people are spreading their clothes on the road is, is a term of respect, as honoring a king that is going in to conquer. Then, as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they'd seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. So they're praising him and they're honoring him and they're singing his praises. Verse 39. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, teacher, rebuke your disciples. So they're trying to stop all this from happening. They are, they are offended that this is happening. And of course, they don't want to see Jesus raised up or lifted up or honored or, or worshiped in any way, shape or form because they are just so, so blind and so full of hate. Verse 40, but he answered and said to them, I tell you, that if, the, that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. And that's the truth. Even had Jesus ordered everyone to be quiet, the earth wouldn't be able to contain itself at the joy of Jesus in his ascent here. And you'll remember that when he was crucified, the stones, the stones did cry out. They cracked in half. The boulders cracked in half. The earth, you know, shook turned black. So yes, the earth recognized him as the Messiah. In verse 41, now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, if you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close in on you every side and level you and your children with you to the ground. And they will not leave you in one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. He was so deeply distraught that his people, the Jewish people who he came back to save had so rejected him. And he just like is just shaking his head and sorry. It's like, if you only realize what was gonna come, what was gonna happen to you all for your rejection of me. And you can just hear his bereaved spirit. He's just, just, oh, it crushes him. Verse 45, and then he went into the temple 
and began to drive out those who bought and sold in it, saying to them, it is written, my house is a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And he was teaching daily in the temple. But the chief priests, the scribes, and the leaders of the people sought to destroy him and were unable to do anything, for all the people were very attentive to hear him. And we all know the story of him driving out the people out of the temple, the people who drove up the price of any of the doves and of the sacrificial animals. And the priests were in on all this corruption because if you brought a perfect dove into them to sacrifice, they would look at that and say, nope, that's not good enough. You have to buy one of our temple doves because they were getting big kickbacks. So he wasn't having it. And there were money changers because you had to have the, the Hebrew money. You couldn't use just any money. So the money changers were also making a heavy, uh, they were making a lot of money on these people that were making a change. And he was not having it. And so he's flipping over tables and he's whipping them out of that temple. And um, he, he wasn't having it. But as he was teaching daily in the temple, the chief priests, the scribes, and the leaders of the people sought to destroy him and were unable to do anything for all the people were very attentive to hear him. So despite the fact that these guys were so hateful of him and so jealous of him and just so against him in every way, shape, and form, and they sought to destroy him and bring him down, they couldn't do anything because the crowds were all around him and so attentive to hear him. So that. Well, they could, couldn't do anything Monday through Thursday, but by Friday, by Thursday night, they figured it out, huh? <laughs> yeah, sadly. Sadly. So, he was upset. He didn't only upset the money tables. He was upset in their, uh, their scheming ways. Was, yes. It was mm -hmm. a business for them. It wasn't, uh, yeah. wasn't about God. Yes. So, Bill, you said that you had uh, noticed some really good things in your uh, in your reading. Yeah, yeah, there was something uh, really, really uh, and, uh, powerful thing, and that was in uh, verse forty three. Uh, uh, that was when Jesus said, "The day will come." Well, what he says, "Your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you, and then uh, hem you in on every side." And that's exactly what happened. In fact, it happened. It says in eighty sixty six. Uh, it was Titus, who was the son of the emperor uh, Vespasian. He was sent to crush the rebellion, but it said Roman soldiers attacked Jerusalem, broke through the northern wall, but still couldn't take the sea. Finally, they laid siege to it, it said. And in 70 AD, uh, they were able to enter the severely weakened city and burn it. 600,000 Jews were killed during Titus's onslaught. So these Pharisees, they brought rack and ruin to 600,000 with their... Uh, their arrogance and their refusal uh, rejected the king. So uh, it, uh, <laughs> this was a big event here. This, this was a major, major happening. Right. Given, the fact, given the fact that the world population back then was in the millions, not the billions. Yeah. Right. That was a yeah. big deal. That was a lot of it, people. Yeah, exactly. It's just unbelievable <laughs> here. Uh, yeah. And it's just what Tom is saying about these leaders among the people. These Pharisees were just horrible people. And they, they, everything that Jesus was doing was, uh, they were against everything. They, they, his teachings often favored the poor over the rich. Uh, his great popularity is in danger of attracting Rome's attention. The leaders of Israel wanted as little as possible to do with Rome. So these Pharisees were, were the horrible creatures of all. Yeah. This is unbelievable. Yeah. They were wicked, for sure. Very, yeah, that's the right word. That's what. That's the word I was looking for, for yeah. sure. Yeah. I know that's well, thank unbelievable. You, thank you, Bill, for that that insight on that, on on the when Titus was in power. I do remember reading something like that too. So thank you for sharing that. So, um, would anybody care to pray us out for the evening? I hope and so I, Bill or you or somebody or is Lou still on here with us? Um, well, Lou is Lou, are you still there? I don't think you can picture and everything. I, I'm gonna have to re re enter somehow. We can hear you okay. We can Lou. hear you. Oh, okay. Okay. 
Well, I can, I can, I can say the prayer then. Okay, that'd be great. Thank you. Oh, Father God, you are so good, and we're so grateful for your love and your care. Thank you for being with us each day and leading us in the way that you would have us go. We thank you for the blessings of this time spent together with friends, learning your ways, observing the way that we should go, and being close to you, close to uh, the way that you want us to be, and always, always grateful for your loving presence. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you.